that that might work for a hobby, but that's not necessarily going to work for a business, right? So because it's not about what you want when it comes to a business, it's about what other people want. It's about giving them what they want. It's and that's that's kind of the key. I think that sometimes you go into business. I can point to several super successful business owners who didn't start out. Um, uh, Fred DeLuca, the guy who started Subway Sandwiches, he started, he was 17 years old. He didn't start out with a passion for feeding people or making sandwiches or food. He was like hanging out on the couch and a family friend said to him, get your butt off the couch before college. You know, he was 17 years old and the guy gave him a thousand dollars and he he said, the only thing I could think of to do with it was open up a small sandwich shop. I mean, it was, it was just like, it was luck, right? That was just sort of an instinct and he did it. And he always told me it wasn't until he opened up his fifth subway that he had a clue what he was doing. He goes, if I knew then what I know now, there never would have been a second subway. It, I would have been, I would have said, this is a really stupid idea. What am I doing? And I would have stopped doing it. Yeah. So, so, uh, so that's the balance, uh, the mystery between passion and knowledge or experience or, or sense of what is lacking, correct? Yes. I think you have to find the balance, Fernando. I think that's really the key. It's not all about um, your passion. It's not all about, um, you know, uh, in, an impartial it, in unpassionate view of business, you have to find both. And the thing is, once you start doing it, if you don't develop that passion for what you're doing, maybe you're in the wrong business because you are going to be doing this, spending so much time doing it. If you don't love it, you're going to be miserable. So it's a balance. You have to feel something about what you are doing, even if you don't understand it at the beginning. But when once you start running in that direction, you have to discover some emotional affection to that uh, endeavor. Is that right? Exactly. That's exactly it. This, this is your life now. And so you, you want to be emotionally attached to what that is. Yeah. And, and uh, tell me about it. Uh, I have this question. Sometimes uh, I see people that really want to impose their idea into the market. They don't take time to to talk to the market like, you know, Steve Blank in the Startup Owner's Manual when they say, you know, the answer is on the street, is not in the in your in your desk, in your in your whiteboard, whatever. What do you, what do you think about that? I think that's exactly right. You cannot impose your idea on the market. Now you might be ahead of your time, right? You might you may have an idea that the market hasn't yet experienced, so they may not have an opinion of it. So, you know, you might want to um, do focus group, talk to people, informal, formal, you know, think about, like, say to people, what would you think if this existed? How much would you pay for it? You don't need to give away your business plan, but you just want to talk to people and, and, and feel them out for what does this mean? You know, how, how could you go about doing that? Um, and, and again, sometimes, sometimes maybe you're, you have the right idea, but you're in the wrong market, meaning in a local business. So maybe maybe that won't work. Maybe you have an idea that really appeals to people with kids, but you live in a community where it's mainly older people. Well, you might be able to move two cities over, two towns over, or open your store or your business two towns over in, that, in a market that does serve kids. And so it's not necessarily bad, you just have to do your homework and your research to say, does the market, does that market exist where I plan to, you know, start and grow my business? Yeah. A wise friend of mine told me once, if you like the piano, you better take lessons. So you're going to really exploit all the beauty of this instrument. In this case, Riva, could you tell me from your perspective, what's your definition of a visionary? I think a visionary is someone who sees something, feels something um, that doesn't quite exist yet. Like one of my uh, heroes, role models, is Jeff Bezos from Amazon. And I was lucky enough to meet him once, quite a long time ago. And Amazon was successful, but not the 
huge mega success that it is today. And he was very persistent. People laughed at him. Amazon would have a report. They were losing money. People would make jokes and, you know, in the newspaper, it's a failure. Why do we even, you know, why are we paying attention? And I, but one of the things that I said to him was, and they were still mainly selling books at the time that I met him. And I said, why did you name your company Amazon? There is no books in the title. And he said, because I have dreams of delivering more than books. And so he was a visionary, right? He came up with books at the beginning because he thought that this would be an easy thing to deliver, an easy way to start that business, to build his brand. But the intention at the beginning was not to build a book delivery company. That's a visionary. He had this big grand vision, but was able to chop it down into parts and take on one part at a time. And I think that's really key too. You very few people go from zero to sixty, right? There's always steps in between that are leading you towards success. Right. What I am reading in between lines here is that Wisdom is the secret. You can be passionate about something, but you have to be rational about the possibilities of the implementation or the creation of your concept. So, and you have to adjust, you have to move. So it's not like you can impose your will most of the times. If you are able to impose your will, that's a huge exception. Isn't right. this accurate? Absolutely right. You have, one of the key traits, I think, of successful business owners is flexibility. They're smart enough to realize they don't know it all, and they're awake enough to pay attention to what the market might be saying to them, and then be able to pivot and and quickly move towards what the market is saying. You know, if, if, the, if, if the market says this, and they, you know, B, and you're stuck on A, you're never going to succeed. But if the market is saying B and you go from, oh, I can do that and go from A to B, now you've found your path. So never be so in love with your idea that you're not willing to change it, adapt it, adjust it, or abandon it and start something else. Right. We are talking about success, but you know, in life, everything is almost colliding. So if you are in love probably suffering is just around the corner. So it's always like that. So if you are very happy, probably you're going to be sad the next day. It's part of nature. Now we're talking about success. What about failure? What's your definition of failure? Failure is a lesson. And if you're smart enough and you're paying attention enough, you will not fail at the same thing twice. But if you, do, if you never fail... That means you're not taking a big enough risk, you're not experimenting, you're not testing, you're not learning. I think failure is one of the, my favorite stories about failure, it can be illustrated by Bill Gates, right? So Windows 3.0 was the magic, right? But he didn't pick, the, there wasn't a Windows 3.0, it's not his starting point, right? That's not where Windows began. There was a one, and it was bad, and he, people said, this sucks. I'm not going to buy this. Why would I do this? So he went back and he listened to what people were saying and he reiterated and there was Windows 2.0. And 2.0 was better, but it still wasn't good. And again, he listened, he reiterated, Windows 3 was the charm. And so you could say he failed twice before he got you know, to, to Windows 3. You could say that Steve Jobs failed because he started at Apple and then he got fired from his own company. Um, and when he came back is when Apple had that spectacular growth and brand, you know, recognition as one of the true innovators in the world. So the me failure is not something to be ashamed of. And I know culturally sometimes that people are um, shy away from failure, but to me, I think it's a kind of very... It's very 21st century to embrace your failures, to learn from your failures, and apply what you learn to the to the next iteration of your business. It is what Steve Blank, like you, his, his bully, Steve Blank is the, the sort of the father of lean business movement. And Steve Blank thinks that people spend too much time, you know, thinking about it. And he says, you know, iterate, get it out in the market. If it works, great. If it doesn't, 
you know, figure out what you did wrong and reiterate and get it out again. It's just a constant, you're constantly, it's like kinetic motion. You're constantly in motion, reiterating, reiterating, reiterating. So what happens uh, if you are very limited in money and you are launching an idea? So are you going to be afraid of failing because you don't have much more money? Is fear an element here? Is a player in this uh, decision making? Yes. I think that probably fear stops great businesses before they even get started. People are afraid they're going to fail. They're afraid they're going to run out of money. They're afraid something's not going to work. So they don't even make the attempt. Um, yeah, money is key, right? But again, if you have a plan, you, you can figure this out. Today, we have other types of resources that didn't even exist five years ago, like, you know, crowdfunding and, and, and things like that, that, you know, enable business owners to get their hands on some money. But the truth is, and this has not changed, Fernando, in, I don't know, the last 30, 35 years, is most startups are self-funded. They are funded by family and friends. A lot of people use credit cards to start their business, which was easier two years ago when they, you could get a lot of 0%, you know, interest rates. So the rates are going up again. And so it may not be the smartest thing in the world, but there's um, you know, maybe that's what you need to do. So you can be creative. And I think um, technology has made startups and to, to run businesses just a whole lot cheaper. It's a lot cheaper to start and a lot cheaper to run a business today because of technology. You know, if you want to be a retailer, let's say that's your dream. Don't, you, know, you don't need to start in a store. Start online. Start selling on, uh, you know, on Amazon or on Etsy or on eBay. You know, pick a marketplace um, and start selling there, and then you can achieve some level of success and open a store. You want to open a restaurant someday? Go get a food truck. Start on a truck. You know, it's a lot cheaper to do that. Build your brand. Build your reputation. Make your mistakes early when you haven't expended a lot of money, and then you can graduate from that truck to a restaurant, to a chain. There's a there's several ice cream stores in New York that started from a from an ice cream truck. You know, they had a truck, they roamed around the streets, they were successful, they opened one store, and now I believe they have three. So it, it starts the smart way, and technology today enables you to do that. Riva, what's the difference between a person, an individual that wants to become an entrepreneur, and the one that feels more comfortable working from nine to five in a, in the corporate world. What what? How could you define the difference between both kind of uh, people? I think if you are, um, you have to be a little bit of a risk taker. You have to be comfortable with risk, right? Everybody might say, "Oh, I'm a risk taker," but some people might not be comfortable with taking that risk. You cannot eliminate risk when you start a business. There's no way to do that. And you can't be fearless. I don't like people who say be fearless because fear is smart, right? You should be afraid because then it tells you what to be alert to. You know, like if you were fearless, you would put your hand, you know, over a fire because you wouldn't be afraid of getting burned. But we're smart. We've learned don't put your hand in a fire because you're going to get burned. So, you know, it's it's that. It's, it's using fear as a warning sign, but it's also being able to see beyond that fear. I think um, one of the one of the traits of successful entrepreneurs is optimism. It's kind of believing in yourself and believing in your concept that it's going to be okay. Now, like you said earlier, at some point, maybe it's not, and you have to recognize that. But I think to get going, to get past that, you have to be optimistic and really believe in yourself. And if you don't, then then there's nothing wrong with being an employee. If you don't want to... Um, involve yourself in something that's going to take a lot of your time to get your business off the ground, it's okay to be an employee, right? I mean, there's millions of really great workers um, in, in this country, and so it's okay. Entrepreneurship is not for everybody, and I don't want anybody to think, 
Oh, I, you know, I'm 